Okay, I think we are live and ready to go. Good evening, everyone, from a gorgeous uh, fall evening in the Death Valley region. And unlike a couple of nights ago, we have no breeze at all or clouds. It's just a absolutely perfect night tonight for us to do a little, little astronomy. And uh, glad you guys are here. Glad you guys are along. And and. Uh, Going to see some uh, mostly galaxies tonight. Tonight we're going to go to um, and do the um, the November Observers Challenge for um, that's uh, produced by the folks on the Cloudy Nights uh, EAA forum. And uh, so tonight we're going to be doing uh, some of those some of those things. Um, and uh, we've got through probably that whole list. And uh, then we'll see where we go from there. See how long that takes us, and uh, and see how long uh, see where we go from there. Um, I could actually show you. Let me see if I can uh, actually pull up <coughs> pull up that uh, that challenge list here. And uh, let me get this. Uh, before we start that off, um, let me uh, show you uh, what my my setup is, um, and uh, for that, um, I think you can probably see it by now. But it's, sometimes it takes a couple of minutes for the. <laughs> One of the interesting challenges about doing this, um, doing these broadcasts, is that. Uh, there's a lag between what I'm saying and doing and what is actually showing up on the screen. And uh, so uh, it makes it a little bit of a challenge. Okay, so, well, what you're seeing right now is a way zoomed in version. Uh, I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, okay, this is not going to work for me to show it to you this way. So I'm going to have to show it to you another way. Um, let me pull up my file browser and just pull it up in a regular photo viewer and that should work fine to show you what uh, what my setup is. So um, I have a 6 inch imaging Newtonian uh, telescope that's the, the white telescope up top here and that is what I do all my imaging in and the camera gets stuck in the focuser that's up the top here and uh, instead of the eyepiece, we're just going to use the camera to see it, uh, see all of our stuff tonight. And uh, that is being controlled and moved around the sky by a Celestron Evolution alt azimuth mount that I have placed on a homemade wooden wedge and a homemade concrete block pier, uh, such that the wedge and pier, the blocks and the wood part, stay outside and stay polar aligned all the time. They stay permanently outside, and the only thing that comes in is my telescope and the mount itself. And uh, so those are the other things that have to come in and out. The rest stays polar aligned, uh, which is very handy because the biggest pain about using a wedge is that you have to polar align it every time you use it, which is a bit of a time-consuming task. And uh, by being able to leave the wedge outside polar aligned permanently, you get to have all the benefits of using it without a lot of the uh, detractions. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to be using tonight uh, to do that. Uh, currently, we are on, a, we are on our alignment star here, which I have used uh, uh, Deneb as our alignment star for the night. So it's kind of how I've checked my focus and uh, checked my alignment that I set up. And so now I'm going to kind of get this dead center right in the middle on those crosshairs or pretty close to them and then uh, we'll be able to synchronize our alignment with the sky with our planetarium come on go ahead over there you can do it and that's probably close enough for our purposes and now I'll synchronize this in here and then tonight uh, I have actually made an, uh, an observation list in Stellarium of the objects for tonight. 
So I'm going to pull up the bookmarks list and we're going to import that list. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, and to do that I need to go on to my other computer. Got this. Observing lists, November 2020, CN Observer Challenge. Okay. And here are uh, those uh, objects that we're going to have in here. We're not necessarily going to do it in this order, though, because some things, uh, like NGC 2444, is actually still below my horizon right now. So we're going to have to wait a while to be able to jump on that one. Um, so uh, we'll kind of bebop around and see what... Uh, see what's up. Okay, so most of these objects, as I said in my post, are going to be galaxies. And uh, because of that, um, <sighs> wow, yeah, because of that I said I was going to use the mono camera, and guess what? I just went on autopilot and put the color camera in. Okay, so course change, no problem. Uh, we do have a few things in here that will show up in color, including the first item on the list, which is the Bubble Nebula. So we might as well just start there. And uh, either we'll try to do the rest of the list in color, or I will just take a few minutes out and swap out the camera, and we'll switch to monochrome and, and do that. So in any event, let's start off with the Bubble Nebula. And the Bubble Nebula is going to be just on the other side of Cepheus from where we are now. So, let's tell the telescope to go over there. And we can make the crosshairs go away now. Now the Bubble Nebula is a pretty small little target, if I remember correctly. Been a while since I've imaged it. Well, maybe not that small. A bit smaller than our thing, but um, it looks like we're pretty well on. Let's see, uh, maximize our stretch and get this in there a little bit. Uh, I think this might be it over here. Mm, let me extend my exposure by a couple of seconds just to get it a little more clearly, but I think this is it over here on the left. I think I'm just barely seeing it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that is it. Okay, so let's bring that more into the center of our view. Yeah, all right, and that should be pretty well centered. And redo that. All right. And then let's extend our exposure to 32 seconds, which is a very good thing to do on a faint target like this and uh, see what we can get from that. <coughs> so again, this is the Bubble Nebula. Oof, that is very bright. Do I have this stretch? Oh, oh yeah, I had it too stretched. And clearly the mount is still moving a little bit, so we're going to have to wait until we settle out, because it looked like the mount was still moving there. <coughs> so I have to wait for the next one to come in. There we go. Those look like regular round stars. Okay. Let's reset our stack, set our enhancement to have a little bit of sharpening, and then hide this away for a minute and see what our first stacked sub-exposure looks like. 
probably have to do some histogram changes as we go along, but until you get at least a couple of a couple of sub exposures in, um, not really enough data to do much with yet. But we can kind of see it's right in here. I'll zoom in a bit so we can see better. But yeah, there it is right there. Just the very beginnings of it right there. And we can see from the from the Stellarium uh, it's telling us how far away is this? About 11,000 light years away. So that's actually fairly far away from us for a uh, for a nebula. Um, usually nebulae are are a bit closer, but this one's uh, this one's nice and far away. So it must be a pretty big, bright one to be showing up that nicely for us when it's uh, you know usually nebulae are a couple thousand, a few thousand light years away. So to see one this far away is kind of interesting. All right, let's see about darkening our background a little bit and then jumping on the stretch a little bit to make it quite a bit brighter and then we'll do a little bit of a color adjustment here to uh, bring our colors hopefully into better balance. Always uh, the auto adjustment down here always adds too much blue. So I always got to end up jumping that backwards a little bit. Yeah, so far so good though. It's starting to come in kind of nice. You can sort of see the bubble right in here. While that's loading up, I'm going to bring up Wikipedia and see what Wikipedia has to say about the bubble nebula. I don't really know a whole lot about it myself. Mm -hmm. Also known as NGC 6822. Bright emission, it's an emission nebula. Hmm, actually Wikipedia doesn't say a whole lot about it. No, it doesn't. Hmm. Hmm, not really sure why that is. Bubble Nebula in Barnard's Galaxy. No, that's not right. Actually, now I think I remember. I think there actually might be from the Bubble Nebula in Earth's galaxy. Okay, yeah, there are. Okay, there are two Bubble Nebulas. Yes, there are two. There are actually two Bubble Nebulas, and that one was the other one. So the one we're on right now is NGC 7635. It's an emission nebula in Cassiopeia. It's close to M52. Is this really in Cassiopeia? Hmm. Contrast of the magnitude of. Yeah, I guess it's kind of between Cassiopeia and Cepheus, so I guess they consider it in Cassiopeia. Interesting, I didn't know that. Okay. The bubble itself, which is the center part here, is created by the stellar wind from a massive hot 8.7 magnitude young central star. The nebula is near a giant molecular cloud which contains expansion of the bubble nebula which contains the expansion of the bubble nebula while itself being excited by the hot central star causing it all to glow, right? Okay. So, 
This is an area of expanding gas, and the entire thing is being lit by the central star, which I assume is this one here, um, in it. So. That's kind of funny. I totally meant to put the monochrome camera in there and just went on autopilot tonight and set up the color camera. That's kind of funny. I think I will switch it out later on. But we'll at least do the first these first objects in color. Although, my plan the next time I used my color camera was to start using flats with the color camera um, to help with some of the um, uneven field illumination I'm getting where some of the background has been darker than other parts. And um, so I I intended on my next use of the color camera to uh, use it with flats. But tonight I kind of uh, surprised myself by <laughs> installing the wrong camera. But Anyway, so far so good. But you can really kind of st start seeing the the bubble forming in here, almost like a soap bubble in the middle of a, a soap bubble in the middle of a uh, a whole region of glowing glowing gas. In this case, an emission nebula being ionized by a central star. Stretch a little bit more, see what we get to see here. Yeah. It's really an adjustment where I have to I have to watch the live stream to know how to adjust it because it's I have to adjust it to look actually poorly on my screen so that it shows up well in the on the live stream. <laughs> but I think it's coming along pretty well. I'm hoping the use of my use of the flats will kind of knock down some of this noise that's in the background a little bit, but <coughs> it looks pretty good on the live stream. Again, a lot of the noise that I'm seeing is just on my screen because I'm, um, let me maximize this too, is what I'm seeing on my screen because I, uh, I have to really over boost, over boost things to, uh, to make it look right, to make it bright enough for you guys on the on the live stream. Because for some reason, some of the signal is uh, lost in transition a little bit. if it said how far away this is. It's an emission nebula lies close to M52. The bubble is created by stellar wind from a massive hot magnitude 
From a massive hot young central star, the nebula is near a giant molecular cloud, which contains the expansion of the bubble while itself being in, excited by the hot central star. So the molecular cloud is this is the rest of the nebula around here that's being lit up, um, and the expansion of the bubble is being contained within that. <coughs> Continuing to go, let's bring up our list here. Uh, well, yeah, that's a galaxy. I think this is also a galaxy. Ah, the Crystal Ball Nebula. Okay. Another galaxy, another galaxy, a little dumbbell. Let's just highlight them all. Well, I think we'll do Little Dumbbell and Crystal Ball. There's a little dumbbell. Yeah, so we're up here now. There's a little dumbbell. And uh, where are you? I think Crystal Ball was a bit lower. Where are you? There it is. Yeah, it's way down here. It's still a little bit low, so we'll do... Yeah, we'll do Little Dumbbell next, and then give Crystal Ball a little time to to rise a little bit higher. Because my, I do have a little bit of a horizon to the east, so <coughs> give that uh, give the crystal ball nebula a little more time to rise. So we'll do little dumbbell next. And I think the rest are pretty much all galaxies. I think those are the only three that aren't. Yeah, galaxy, galaxy, PGC is a galaxy, Superman galaxy obviously is a galaxy, Triangulum. Yeah, the rest of these are all galaxies. Okay. I thought they were. Okay. the stretch a little bit more so we get a little bit more brightness out of it. Kind of a pretty thing though. In a very rich star field but it's in the Cassiopeia Cepheus area, which is, uh, you know, the Milky Way goes right through here, so it's, uh, we're up here, and this is the, the Milky Way goes right up through all of this, so we're seeing it in a very, in a very rich star field. I think we'll probably save that now. Not that I named it, but... Okay. The Bubble Nebula. And we'll stop that stack. And we'll back this up a little bit. We've got little dumbbell selected on here, so let's just go to it. And a little 
Dumble is what? M76, I believe. Yes. M76 will actually name this one. What a novel concept. Okay. This is probably that star there, but let's put a bit of a stretch on this. And See what we get. So we got one bright star here. We got something in here. Oh, that's got to be it right there. That's a got to be it right there. Yeah, and this star. Yeah. Okay, that's got to be it right there. So let's center us a little bit. Bring it into the center. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. So we'll synchronize on that. I'm not sure why the mount is jumping around like that when I just synchronize. My mount seems to be a little bit jumping around. Well, that was too much. My mount seems to be... <laughs> Not sure why it's doing that. Okay, well anyway. Let's go back to normal thing here and increase to 30 seconds. Thanks, Curtis. Good evening. Yeah, we just did the bubble nebula. Now we're going to move on to uh, the little dumbbell here. Since I accidentally screwed up and put the color camera in tonight, just running on autopilot, we're going to do the nebulae first, and then I think we're going to take a five-minute break and put the uh, swap the cameras out. But, since we've got there the old one out. But since we've got the uh, color camera in, might as well do the color objects to start off. So, Very grainy for the first few sub-exposures. Nice thing about stacking is as you bring more sub-exposures in and stack them on top, the software knows what stuff is noise. Boom, saw it right there, it got dark. That was the, uh, that was the application of the second frame on top of the first. And with every sub-exposure that comes in, the stuff that his background gets darker and less noisy, and the objects themselves get brighter. And uh, <coughs> it just improves and improves and improves with every sub exposure that comes in. Third one applied. I'll give this a couple of minutes. Actually, you know what? I'll be back in just a second. I forgot to get my water. So I'm going to go get that while this is uh, continuing to build. So I'll be right back.
Alright, that's better. The Little Dumbbell Nebula. Let's see what... Let's see what Wikipedia has to say about the Little Dumbbell. Also known as M76, Messier 76, the Barbell Nebula, or the Cork Nebula. The planetary nebula in the constellation Perseus it was discovered by Pierre Michon, Michon in 1780 and included in Charles Messier's catalog of comet-like objects as number 76. It was first recognized as a planetary ne nebula in 1918 by the astronomer Hébert Doust Curtis. However, there is some Attention to this claim. Um, so maybe there's some contention there, so I guess they're not really sure. Um, the structure is now classed as a bipolar planetary nebula. Distance is currently estimated as about 2,500 light years, making the average dimensions about one and a quarter light years across. Total nebula shines at the apparent magnitude of plus 10 with its central star or planetary nebula nucleus at a magnitude of 16. I don't know if we're going to be able to see its nucleus star in this. We may be a little bit too blown out for that. We have to back off a little bit, maybe darken it down a little bit, but you know, I'm not sure we're going to be able to see that. Uh, da, 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 little Dumbbell derives its common name from its resemblance to the Dumbbell Nebula M27, which is a much bigger, brighter version of this. It was originally thought to consist of two separate emission nebulae, and thus was given two catalog numbers. Some people consider this object to be one of the faintest and hardest to see objects in the Messier list. I don't think we're going to be able to see the central star anyway, so I might as well just leave it nice and bright. But you can see it's got kind of a nice shape to it, almost a sort of a spiral shape, where it's got, definitely got the bar at the core, and then you've got sort of two spirals coming off in that direction and that direction. You can take a look and see what, uh, oops, no, not that. Take a look and see what. So, I don't know if that's a Hubble picture or whatever, but in, in uh, Stellarium, it's almost like a Omega symbol in there, sort of, with a bar in the center and then two ears coming off the side there. <coughs> bar in the center there and these two ears that come off, one on each side, almost like the uh, electromagnetic lines of force that come off a... Uh, a battery, but uh, well, as a planetary nebula, this is basically just a a star, not unlike our our sun, sort of a main sequence star that has uh, reached near reached near the end of its life and uh, starts expelling layers of gas outward into the surrounding space. Uh, but the star itself doesn't go out, so it illuminates those expanding, that expanding bubble, if you will, of gas as it goes out and uh, forms a planetary nebula. Kind of a neat looking one. When I'm looking at the live stream, it looks like maybe I can push this stretch maybe a little bit more. So back this off a little. And let's see how that goes. Let's see if that doesn't make it a little, a little bit easier to, a little bit brighter. Uh, am I having some? No, I don't think so. Looks like everything's working well here. Oh. Wow. Uh, I may 
be having some uh, I may be having some connection issues. My ISP has been having some trouble here, um, and it's looking like um, yeah my my internet connection is kind of uh, getting a little blinky here. So if you're seeing some hourglassing. Um, it's probably not at your end, it's probably at mine. Well, it seems to be stable now. For some reason there was a little bit of a hiccup there. Where it was uh, dropping for some reason. Not sure what, but all of a sudden my uh, my internet bandwidth just kind of like dropped off and almost disappeared. Not sure what that's about. Well, anyway, like I said, I've been having a little bit of internet stuff going on today, so if you get some hourglassing um, on the uh, on the stream, it's probably at my end, probably not yours. I seem to be having little blips here and there with it going uh, in and out, but anyway, mostly it seems to be okay, I guess. Hey Frank, yeah, um, yeah, the audio, yeah, the audio is probably the last thing to go. Honestly, uh, the video is what takes up all the bandwidth, so that will be the the first thing to be sacrificed, uh, unless it all comes in as one chunk. Uh, the video will probably be the first thing to be sacrificed and either drop in quality or be cut off. But yeah, I mean, once again, it's. Uh, my connection seems to be stable for the moment, but it seems to be having some hiccups. So, Dumbbell Nebula. is a pretty small little object. I don't know if zooming in anymore is going to help. But might just make it more grainy. But it's kind of a cool little structure. It's not just a not just a circular blob like the ring nebula. Um, or even dumbbell, which has a sort of an apple core shape, but still is fairly circular. This is a little bit more interesting. Crystal ball. 
Well, it's gotten over 30. It's just barely poked its head over 30 degrees. Where is it relative to Pleiades? Pleiades is up here, isn't it? Oh no, Pleiades is right there. Okay. So, you now I can see the Pleiades right now. So I think that should, I should be able to see Crystal Ball. I think it's just barely cleared. Yeah, so between Pleiades and Capella I think is pretty clear. So yeah, I think it's just barely cleared my uh, my roof line. So we can probably do that now. <clears throat> Give this a couple of more, more subs. That's probably pretty good. GC fifteen fourteen. Okay, let's save this. And then we'll stop our stack. And we're going to go to NGC 1514 next. Oh, laptop needs food. Okay, plug you in. There you go. All right. And let's go to the crystal ball next. Send the scope over. Yeah, it's looking like that's going to clear just fine. Okay, let's zoom in here and see. Well, we got a few bright stars in there. Yeah. Boost our stretch a bit. One, two, three. Hmm. These three stars here. Is that those? Uh, <laughs> interesting thing about using a, a telescope on a wedge or other equatorial mount is things don't stay upright anymore. Things kind of tip over and twist around and it's hard to tell. But I'm thinking actually I'm thinking this might be it right there. I'm thinking that let me let me uh, put a few extra seconds on there, but I'm thinking it's right here. Yeah, there's clearly something right there that looks very much like it. Yep. Okay. So, let's move that. Let's move that up into our view a little bit more here. Center this up. Bring it up a little higher. 
is probably about. Come on. That's the wrong way. Come on. Come on back. Come on back. <coughs> That's probably about right. Okay. Give them out a moment or two to settle here. And go back. Reset our stretch there. Go back to 32 second exposures. And let's see if we can see for the Crystal Ball Nebula. It's in my eastern sky, which is right over Las Vegas. Um, which is about 80 miles to the east of me. But by the time you get to 30 degrees or so up, it uh, the light dome is uh, pretty much eliminated. So, all right, let's go ahead and stack this. So 15, 14, let's clear the little dumbbell out. And give this a couple of sub-exposures to build some data to play with here. That's a pretty nice start. Although the stars are looking a little bit streaky, so I think I caught an exposure where the mount was moving just a little bit, so I'm going to reset the stack again and let it start over again. Because I think this, the mount was still moving a little bit when I was taking the first exposure. My stars were more like eggs or streaks than they were round, so probably just that first sub-exposure got in there and wasn't so round. Yeah, that looks a bit better. Yeah, stars are a lot more round this time. You can also see in this uh, image here why I want to uh, run flats. That my field illumination is not perfectly even because you can see toward the corners, the corners are dark. The corners are def the corners and edges are definitely darker than the middle, and that's simply because my optics um, don't perfectly evenly illuminate across the field. The middle's a little bit better at transmitting light than the out outsides are. And so uh, what a flat frame does is it analyzes how your telescope collects light and it knows that some areas get less than others and so when you apply your, when it does that analysis and creates a flat frame um, it applies that flat frame to all of your images coming in such that the areas that are typically lighter it darkens them a little bit so that all of your images coming in have a much more flat and even uh, illumination across its, across its uh, span, size. And so um, it just makes your illumination better and the uh, the illumination of the entire field of view 
to be more even. I'm still getting a little star streak here, but it's not too bad. <coughs> So Randy asks a question about plate solving. Um, when you use the plate solving button in SharpCap, how does it know which star to center? I've not seen anything being selected. Uh, plate solving, Randy, doesn't need a star to select. Um, what plate solving does is it takes an image of a section of the sky, and we'll, you know, take this one here on the screen. Um, if uh, the camera being used by the plate solver takes this image right here, it doesn't focus on any particular star. It focuses on all the stars or a number of the brightest stars in the image and says, okay, that star is there, that star is there. And then it looks in its database to find a matching pattern of stars in its database. And at lightning computer speed, it fairly quickly can determine um, uh, which exact star pattern it is seeing in that image uh, because it's gone into its database uh, and, and actually it helps itself a little bit because when it goes into the database it assumes it, it first of all it knows from the telescope approximately where you're pointed to within a, a few degrees and so it starts in the general region of um, when it looks in its database, it doesn't just do a blind plate solve and start anywhere in the sky randomly. It starts where it thinks, where the telescope is telling it it's pointed. And so it starts looking there in its database of star images, of sky patterns, to see, um, to match against the image that just got taken by the camera. And so fairly quickly finds, okay, this is where it's exactly pointing because these stars match all of these stars in this database image I have. And so it knows from a number of stars in the image that it's analyzing where it's pointing in the sky. So it doesn't really center on a particular star. It picks a number of targets in the image, a number of stars in the image, and matches that pattern of stars to one of its database images to know exactly where it's pointing. <coughs> and Frank, yes, SharpCap, while it has the plate solving feature, it doesn't actually contain the plate solving engine or the database files that have all the images that it uses to compare. Uh, it, re it relies on another piece of software to do that. Uh, Astro Tortilla is one of them. All Sky Plate Solver is another one. Um, and there's a new one that's just come out recently in the last few months um, that uh, everybody's really liking, including me, and it's called ASTAP, A-S-T-A-P. And um, it's really, really fast. Um, much, much faster than Astro Tortilla or ASPS. And so it... Uh, um, while I have had issues in the past using it, um, those issues are no longer there. Uh, I, have, uh, I have been using it quite successfully now for a few nights, and uh, it works very well. It seems to be really, really fast compared to Astro Tortilla or the other, the other plate solvers. And uh, I've been liking that. But yes, SharpCap merely calls another plate solving engine to do its plate solving functionality. It doesn't uh, have it built in. You know, I mean, Robin, Robin Glover, who does the, uh, the SharpCap software, is smart enough to know that he doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. And uh, if it's already, already being done well somewhere else and it can be incorporated, he'll just allow you to incorporate it if you want to use it. And not everybody uses plate solving, so not everybody's going to do it anyway. But uh, it's uh, if you do any kind of imaging and already have a camera stuck in your your focuser, um, it's uh, you already have everything you need, so it's just a it's just a wonderful thing to use. Because if you uh, if you honestly can't figure out where the heck you're looking, you can just push that button and it not only figures out where you're looking, but how far off you are, and then automatically repositions your telescope 
to be pointing at where you wanted to be pointing at and not where you actually ended up. It's almost magical. <coughs> but here's our crystal ball nebula. You know, and I haven't actually looked at uh, looked it up in Wikipedia, so let's see what Wikipedia has. Okay. NGC fifteen fourteen. Let's see if it likes that better. NGC fifteen fourteen. Didn't seem to like Crystal Ball Nebula much, so Planetary Nebula in the constellation Taurus, positioned to the north of the star Psi Tauri, along the constellation border with Perseus. Distance estimates for this, ne this nebula vary widely, with a range of 650 to almost 1,000 light years, considered the most plausible. Discovered by William Herschel in 1790, who described it as a most singular phenomenon forcing him to rethink his idea on the construction of the heavens. Up until this point, Herschel was convinced that all nebulae consisted of masses of stars too remote to resolve, but now here was a single star surrounded with a faintly luminous atmosphere. He concluded, Our judgment, I may venture to say, will be that the nebulosity about the star is not of a starry nature. It's a double-shell nebula that is described as a bright, roundish, amorphous planetary nebula with a radius of around 65, which I'm assuming is arc, yeah, 65 arc seconds, and a faint halo that has a radii of 90 arc seconds. It consists of an outer shell, an inner shell, and bright blobs. <coughs> the nebula originated from a binary star system. The bright visible component is a giant star on the horizontal branch while the nebula generating companion is now a hot subluminous O-type star. During the formation of the nebula, the pair shared a common envelope and had an orbital period of around four to nine days. The progenitor star had a mass estimated at four and a half times the mass of the Sun. When the progenitor entered its early asymptotic, asymptotic giant branch phase and expanded to fill its roach lobe, Mass transfer occurred and the pair spiraled inward by transferring their orbital energy into the expanding envelope. Oh, interesting. lot of planetary nebulas, but they tend to be pretty small and pretty dim. So, and thanks to me screwing up tonight, we got to see them in color. But I think uh, once I get done here, let this go for another minute or two, and then I think I'll uh, take a five minute break here and uh, swap the camera out, and we'll go, uh, we'll go to the monochrome for the rest of the objects tonight. So, we'll take a uh, five minute coffee break here in a little bit and um, swap the camera out for the monochrome camera and we'll do the rest of the objects uh, I believe all of which are galaxies so <coughs> let's see how we're down here yeah we're doing pretty good a little bit of a color balance which will of course give too much blue, as it always does. And darken this up a little bit.
Okay, Randy, yeah. Um, but when target is selected in Stellarium, sometimes it's not well centered in sharp cap. Right. And that's just because um, um, yeah, the, the go to is off by a little bit, and that's what pl uh, plate solving is very handy for. Then plate solve is pressed and the object gets centered. How does it know which one to center? Ah, okay. It knows which one to center because uh, Stellarium and SharpCap and the telescope are all connected together in the computer. So they're, they're all essentially talking to each other. So I'm using Stellarium to control a telescope. So I select the object in Stellarium, and then I tell Stellarium to send the telescope there. So the telescope, uh, so the Stellarium knows what the desired object is, and the telescope also knows what the desired object is, but the telescope doesn't actually know what it's seeing. It needs the camera for that. So Stellarium and the telescope mount are saying I'm pointing at the crystal ball nebula. But then the resulting image in sharp cap says mm, you're not exactly pointing there, you're actually pointing over here. And so when you push the plate solve button, the plate solver says, okay, telescope, where do you want to be pointing? Oh, you want to be pointing at crystal ball. Let's take a picture and see where we're actually pointing. And so it takes the picture through sharp cap and says, okay, well, we are actually pointing over here a third of a degree away, but you want to be pointing there because you're telling me that's where you want to be pointing. And so then it does the math and says, okay, you need, to re you need to move over in this direction, this amount, and then you'll be right on it. And that's what plate solving does. Hopefully that was more clear. If not, go ahead and ask another question. I'll see if I can clarify it a little more. <coughs> You're actually starting to see some of the structure in here and now. You can see some of the darker spots and some of the lighter spots, some of the blobs that Wikipedia was talking about with this. It's not an evenly lit structure. There are areas of dark and, and areas of bright in it. Kind of neat. So I can zoom in a little bladder. Is the plate solving feature compatible with Celestron star sense? Um, well, the short answer is no. Um, StarSense is a plate solver. Uh, they are basically doing the same thing. That's how StarSense actually works. When you fire up your telescope and it does the alignment procedure, it slews the telescope around the sky to a few spots, takes pictures, and says, okay, over here it was pointing at that spot, over here it was pointing at that spot in the sky, and over here it was pointing at that spot in the sky, therefore triangulating all that stuff, here's where the rest of the sky is and now it knows where everything is. So, StarSense is a plate solver, however, it's, it, all it knows how to do is the alignment setup routine, that's it. It doesn't know how to do anything else. Uh, StarSense, once you have the uh, Oh, I got a neighbor just blasting headlights in here right now. We may lose a sub there. Um, uh, it the only thing it knows how to do is the alignment procedure, and then once the alignment procedure is done, that's it. Star Sense essentially shuts down. There is no way to access the Star Sense camera after by any other piece of software. This. Uh, this has actually been discussed over and over in Celestron forums and things like that. So it's like, what, you know, why can't we use the camera? It's already doing plate solving. Why can't we do plate solving with it after the alignment's done? And the answer is because it wasn't designed to do that. It's just basically an alignment tool, and um, that's all it's supposed to do. And after the alignment is done, 
it basically just shuts off, and there's no, you can't you can't access the images. Um, you can't control the camera, and even if you could, you can't access the images coming from them, because that's just a communication between the the StarSense camera and the hand controller. Uh, it's it's kind of a one-trick pony, and that's all it will do. Even though it is a plate solver, it doesn't. After the alignment's done, its its job is done, so it just quits. Um, so anyway, there you are. But it's still a very cool thing to have, and I and I still love mine. Hopefully that that cleared that up, Frank. But uh, if not, ask again. I think we've probably gotten pretty much everything out of the uh, crystal ball nebula that we're going to get. So I think at this point, I am going to save this image. And... Doink. And then I am going to shut off the stacking. And at this point, it's coffee break time. And you can see, see, you can see again the uneven illumination in here. How much lighter it is here than out here. Flat frames will help resolve a lot of that stuff. But anyway, um, <coughs> um, so anyway, I am going to uh, uh, step away from the camera here for a minute. I'm going to uh, actually just uh, close this down. And close this camera. In fact, I think yeah, I'll just close the camera down, and I'm going to um, swap the camera out for our monochrome camera. So um, I'll be back in uh, just a couple of minutes uh, with the monochrome camera installed. So everybody, take a take a bathroom break, take a coffee break, um, whatever you want, and I'll be back um, in a few minutes.
Okay. Well, um, so I have the camera installed uh, in the telescope now, um, but I'm realizing that um, now that I'm using the wedge um, and using 32 second exposures, I don't have a master dark to use with the camera um, at 32 seconds yet. So what I'm currently doing at the moment is creating a master dark frame in SharpCap for my monochrome camera at 32 seconds of exposure. And that's going to take a few minutes to do that. So uh, you can see kind of down here in the lower right hand corner I've done 14 out of 26 frames. And the frames are uh, you know, obviously 32 seconds each, so it's going to take a few minutes. Uh, looks like it's saying it's going to take about another six minutes or so to do that. But once it's uh, once it's done, that only has to be done once. And once it's done that, um, then uh, then we're good. But uh, it's going to take a few minutes to do that. Um, so Randy says, my understanding is when star sense is working well, go to objects should be nicely centered by having an additional plate solving tool available in sharp cap centering can be assured. Yeah. Um, yes, if star sense is working well and your mount is perfectly accurate as well, and usually neither one of those things are, tr are perfectly true, um, things should be nicely centered, um, and usually that's true. I mean, especially if you're if you're just doing visual observation and you've got a wide field eyepiece. Um, if your star sense is calibrated really well to your telescope, such that they both are pointing fairly precisely to the same spot in the sky, um, then when star sense does your initial alignment, all of your go-to's. Um, for a wide field eyepiece should be well within the inner 50% of your of their field of view of, of that eyepiece. Um, if you've got it really calibrated nicely it can uh, even be in the inner 50% of a, a moderately high magnification eyepiece. Um, <clears throat> but um, for me I don't really worry about it so much. I mean for me it's, it's typically close enough. Um, especially when I'm using something like the the 533, the color camera that I had in there, uh, which has a one degree field of view. For a camera that's a, well, for me that's a fairly generous field of view for a camera. There are certainly more expensive cameras out there that have much bigger sensors and like when you start talking about full frame sensors and DSLRs and those kind of things that have much bigger sensors then you get you know two or three degree fields of view sometimes. Um, but for me, a one degree field of view, that's a pretty generous field of view for a camera. And so I, I rarely, my, my, uh, my star sense is calibrated well enough to my camera that, uh, um, and well enough to my scope, excuse me, that, uh, that my objects are almost always, uh, within the field of view somewhere. And, uh, I don't usually have trouble finding them. Uh, so I don't end up having to use the plate solving button very much. Um, but you're right. When you when you do need to use it, it's very handy um, and does a pretty darn good job of centering the object in your uh, in your field of view. Again, it comes down to the accuracy of your of your mount and uh, and how well you have the star sense calibrated to your actual telescope. But uh, uh, but but I really like it. You know, for me, the star sense just completely automates my alignment, which saves a lot of time and frustration, and um, I don't have to use a finder scope to find what I'm to my alignment stars, and I don't have to worry about my approach direction when I approach an alignment star, which you have to do on the Celestron mounts, and the whole thing is just sort of automated, and it's uh, it's a very nice feature. Um, especially when something like tonight happens where occasionally an alignment gets messed up and so you know I, I, I'm getting ready to do a, a live stream and um, I do my alignment and use up you know 
half of my preparation time to get ready for the event and the alignment screws up. And so in this case, because the StarSense camera wasn't fully plugged in right. And so I have to start the whole thing over from scratch again. Well, the fact that it's fully automated and fairly quick means I don't have to stress about it too much. I just turn everything off, reset everything, turn it all back on correctly, and send it off on its way, and it fully automates the, the alignment, which, which is just huge. And, uh, and even, if it all, even if that alignment is off a little bit, um, because of the use of plate solving, I don't really need my go-to's to be spot on anyway, because uh, plate solving will automatically put me in the in the field where I want to be, you know, in in on the object that I that I need it to be on. So, and the smaller the field of view you have with your camera, the more important plate solving is. If you have a small sensor camera, and or a telescope with a long focal length such as you're getting only a small field of view um, when you look when you when in whatever you're seeing through your camera it's uh, it's hard to find stuff when you <laughs> when you have a pretty small field of view because if the object doesn't show up in there um, you don't know what you're looking at because you there's so few things in your in your field of view so um, I really like plate solving. It uh, it saves your bacon. I mean, I, I didn't always have larger sensor cameras. I sometimes I've had really small sensor cameras. In fact, now when we go to the 178 mono here, it's going to be about half the size, a little bit less than half the size, in fact, <coughs> of um, of the field of view of the 533 that we've been using. So um, you know, it's going to be it's going to be smaller. So, okay, now I'm going to put the microphone back down again because we've finished taking our dark frame, our master dark, and so now I'm going to uncover the telescope and we'll get the get the, get it focused. stretch on it. And one thing I forgot to do was actually point it at uh, a bright star. <laughs> it's just pointed at kind of random stars right now. So where are we pointed here? Okay, yeah, we're still in crystal ball. So I probably want to go to something bright. Ooh, Capella would be nice. Capella is a nice bright star. But let me get it a little bit better focused first. So that's approximate. So now let's get us on Capella. Send the telescope over. And that will be a nice bright star that we can actually uh, focus the scope on. With the mask. Yeah, <laughs> that is a nice bright blazing star. Like that brighter the star, the easier it is. Okay, so now I'm going to actually focus it. I'll be right back.
that should be pretty much right on for us. Okay. So, hundred. Oh yeah, I'm not gonna be able to know that. No, that's not what I need. Okay, so. Uh, thousand. Let's put our stretch back to where we want it to be. All right. So now we can come back in here and start going back through our objects. All right. Well, we got that one there. Where are we at? Okay. Bubble. We've done bubble. We've done the nebula. So. All right, well, let's start. Well, since we're already down here, crystal ball, we're on Capella, yeah. So let's do our first object, Perseus A. Uh, which is not. So we'll do it that way. All right. And. Oh, did I? Well. You know what? Did I forget to? You know what? I think I might have forgotten to synchronize on Capella. Where is the? Yeah, actually, they look like it's dead on. So you know what? Let's just go back. Okay. Actually, it does look like it's on. So let's just send the scope. Going to be NGC twelve seventy five. Twelve seventy five. All right. Well, we'll <laughs> let's see if we can see anything. Now, in this case. Because we are doing, uh... Hey, Mitch, glad to see you here. Glad to see you guys stayed up late on the East Coast to watch this. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be looking at a little bit of a galaxy here, but this is one of those situations where um, um, it's such a small, faint object that I may have to use plate solving to... Uh, see if I can see it. Let's do an aggressive stretch. Oh, okay, no, see, there we are right here. Here's a bunch of faint fuzzy ones right there. Yeah, so that's exactly, the, 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 there's the whole chain of them right here, which is this whole chain right here, so I think we're pretty much, pretty much right on. But, just for the heck of it, let's try the plate solver anyway. Astromestic stacking program. The one thing you do need to change, you need to make sure that you have the field of view, which for my other camera is 1.07, but for this one is 0 0.047. So that's the one thing you do want to do want to save. File settings, save settings. You do want to make sure that that sounds, make sure it's stuck. It did. Good. Okay. Now, if we come in here and do our plate solve. <coughs> Let's see if this works. That's not a good sign. Usually it would have solved it by now. Yeah, see, this is, uh, I'm not sure this is going to work. This is the problem I sometimes have with ASTAP. Um, I switch cameras, and even though I change the field of view, it, uh, 
for some reason it gets confused. And we'll give this a minute, but I think it's not going to work out. Hmm. For some reason it does not like working with the 178, so I'm not sure why. But well, let's see if I can I, now I can't even kill it. Okay, good. Go away. You're obviously not working. So these are where they are right in here, so I just need to uh move those over, center that up a little bit because this is obviously what uh, what we're looking for. Come on, go left please. Hmm. Um. Oh, that's weird. For some reason, my mount is not responding. Let's see if this is... No, oh, see, that didn't move anything. Okay, come on. I need you to move to the left. Move, 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 move. Okay. Go. That's probably going to be about right for these guys. Ah, too much. Yeah, that's probably going to be about right. All right, let's see what 32 seconds of exposure will do. these are little galaxies up in here so kind of a cool little little thing here all right wow definitely pretty bright oh I know why because I've got that enabled yeah you can see all these fuzzy spots in here okay good so let's start our stack uh, and this is yeah 75, that's right. Let's clear the old one out. Reset this, and all these color bars will go away since I now am using a monochrome camera. It'll eventually figure out that there is no color. I think actually this is one of the faintest objects that we'll be looking at tonight. <coughs> These are uh, really small, faint galaxies. Let's see if we can clean this up a little bit. Darken it down a little bit. Get the dark background a little darker. Yeah. yeah. Let's start getting some of these. You can see obviously these fuzzy patches in here. 
And I think 1275 is this one right here on the corner, if I'm right. Yeah, see this one here, it's on the kind of this corner of fuzzy, fuzzy things. Now, because I've, I'm using an equatorial mount with the telescope kind of pitched on its side a little bit here, things are a different orientation from what we're seeing in the uh, in the planetarium software. But uh, if you kind of reorient yourself to it, I think it's you can figure out. That's I'm pretty sure this is this is 1275 here. What is it? An active galaxy, mag 12, uh, with the distance, 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 about 224 million light years away. 224 million light years. So, that's a long ways away. The light that's right now hitting the sensor of the camera and bouncing into our eyes left there 224 million years ago. Like, way back. And, it's, and you can just see how many galaxies are in here. Because there are just lots and lots of galaxies in here. You All these fuzzy spots in here. That's definitely a galaxy. Chances are this is. All these fuzzy spots in here. See, this one's fuzzy fuzzy. This is a star. It's nice and sharp, you can tell. But these fuzzy spots are all galaxies. Fuzzy spot, sharp star. Fuzzy spot, sharp star. Oh, and there's another galaxy here. Uh, that's, that's a little bit too faint, maybe. Hard to tell. Galaxy, galaxy, galaxy. <laughs> all a galaxy. All these galaxies in here. Just a, a very rich field of them. <coughs> no, that's, no, that's probably one up there. <coughs> Just a whole star field full of galaxies. Darken the sky background a little bit more. We'll bring those out a little bit better. Maybe stretch, make the stretch a little bit more aggressive. <coughs> now it's even easier to tell which ones are the fuzzy patches and which ones are uh, which ones are stars and which ones are the fuzzy patches that are galaxies. This is just a a rich section in here of uh, of galaxies. Push the stretch a little more. Make it easier for you guys to see it on the stream. But yeah, now it's the more you push the stretch, the easier it's, it is to tell the sharper stars from the fuzzy blobs, the glowing fuzzy blobs that are obviously galaxies. There's a galaxy and a pair of sharp stars and a fuzzy glowing galaxy. Almost looks like a spiral galaxy that we're seeing sort of on edge there. <coughs> Lots of them. And this is why also you use the, the monochrome camera for galaxies, because galaxies respond... Monochrome cameras, I guess, respond very well to galaxies. Getting that full spectrum of infrared light that galaxies like to produce that a lot of color cameras don't like so much. Fun. <coughs> but this is just a, you know, I mean, th these are these are kind of interesting. Uh, there, you can't see really any structure in them. 
Um, but the most, but the coolest part of this picture is just seeing how many galaxies are in this image. And we now know there's, we're now suspecting there's as many galaxies in the universe as there are stars in our Milky Way, which is literally hundreds of billions. <clears throat> I think the latest estimate is a couple hundred billion or a few hundred billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And we're now thinking there's probably that many galaxies out there as well that we are aware of. They're just, they're just everywhere. Literally billions of galaxies containing billions of stars each. I mean, the possibilities are beyond mind-boggling. Pretty cool. All right. I think we'll save that as is. And turn off our live stack. Now we're going to see. I'm going to turn this down as well. I want to get, see if I can't center up 1275 again, which I think, yeah, it's right here. Pretty sure, yeah, it's right there. Okay, good. I want to center that up. I want to center that star up and synchronize our mount. too far. That's about right. And put it right about there. Oh, we got a satellite moving right through our image. Boing! Look at that. <laughs> Alright, that's probably pretty close. <coughs> okay, and we'll go to our next object. Which I guess we'll just do, we did that one, we did that one, yeah, so let's do NGC 1003. <coughs> well, obviously a fuzzy object right in the middle there. So I think we're pretty much dead on. Let's Stretch it a few seconds here just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure that's it. Yep, sure enough. Okay, good. That looks right. So, actually, no, going the wrong way. We'll do the full 32 seconds. Reset. <coughs> Start our stack. Uh, shoot, before I do that though, NGC 1003, let's get the right name on it. 1003, start our stack, clear out 1275, <coughs> and start on the new one. Al from Arizona. Hi, Al. Nice to see you here. Um, is my camera cooled? Uh, the color camera that I was using earlier is cooled, but this monochrome camera is not. The general rule of thumb is if you're doing 30 second or so exposures or less, cooling doesn't really gain you much benefit unless you, you know the weather is pretty warm or something. Uh, so. Uh, no, I tend not to buy cooled cameras, typically, because I just do EAA, short exposure, um, 
photography essentially um, and uh, so I don't usually usually get a cooled camera um, and in this case the monochrome camera is not however now that I've started using a wedge and an equatorially mounted scope and I can do longer exposures I may start going into the market and uh, use market and see if I can pick up basically the same sensor in a cooled camera um, which gives me the opportunity to um, take longer exposures even in warmer weather and maintain a cool cool enough sensor that I don't get a bunch of noise <coughs> Alright, well, we're seeing a little bit of structure here. Let me, uh, oops, come on. I'm clipping my blacks a little here. Push the stretch a little bit. But, uh, kind of see we've got some, uh, a little bit of structure forming on this galaxy. <coughs> Um, well, here, let me, uh, the current gain I'm using, uh, is, uh, 400. I'm using 400 gain, uh, with a 32 second exposure. <coughs> and I'm using, I'm running dark frames with this. Um, I, I don't remember, what is my brightness level? I don't remember if I even set that very much. My brightness is set at yeah, the default 10. Uh, thanks, Al. Yeah, it's um, 400 gain is usually considered pretty high um, for most astrophotographers um, who use tend to use much lower gain settings, which you can get away with if you're doing really long exposure astrophotography, um, and is also desirable because the lower the gain that you're using on the camera, the more dynamic range it has, and so you get a little bit more dynamic range, more color depth, tighter stars, etc. Um, but for those of us who do short exposure EAA type things where you're just basically spending several minutes on something just to see how well you can see it and uh, moving on, um, we, uh, in order to be able to see something in those shorter time periods and using much shorter um, exposures, tend to crank the gain up a bit more so we tend to run higher gains to pull our images in in briefer periods of time and uh, typically we're also using mounts that an astrophotographer would find quite inferior um, and in my case a simple Altaz mount that's on a homemade wedge and uh, so you know something that an astrophotographer would probably never use but uh, but again for my short my short astrophotography it uh, uh, excuse me my short exposure EAA it uh, it works real well so um, us EAAers tend to stick to short exposure and high gain which can result in some blotchier stars and more noise but uh, it, it works well you know, we're not trying to get the Hubble images when we're, we're doing it. We're, our CAAs are just trying to 
the real litmus test for me when I'm doing my camera, my imaging work, is um, just trying to see something a lot better than I could see it through the eyepiece. I'm not trying to get Hubble images. I'm just trying to trying to see an object way better than I could see through an eyepiece. And with a camera, uh, I can. I mean, I might. I, all I'm using is a little six-inch imaging Newtonian, and with that and a camera, I can see way more, way more color with a color camera, way more structure, way more detail than I could even through a 20-inch daub. And so I just, I really like the heck out of it. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And for those who don't live in dark sky areas or don't have access to a dark sky area, living in the urban pollution, uh, the light, urban light pollution that is ever growing in our world. Um, the nice thing about EAA is it allows you to see things again that you can't see with a visual scope. It allows you to cut through a lot of the light pollution, especially with filters and things, and, uh, and see things in the night sky again, even in full color. Even if you're in Bortle 7, Bortle 8, or worse, right in the middle of the city, um, you can still see stuff using uh, using cameras and smaller scopes that you could never see with even a big a big visual scope so <clears throat> all right so this is NGC 1003 let's see what Wikipedia has to say about this if they have any info NGC 1003 let's see what Wikipedia has to say it's a spiral galaxy located in Perseus, about 28 million light years. Oh, really, this is only 28 million? Well, Stellarium says 44 million. <laughs> Not uncommon. Different catalogs have often conflicting information. Anyway, it's not one of the real far ones. The stuff we were just looking at earlier was 230 million light years away, so this is relatively close, comparatively speaking. So, uh, that's kind of fun. Let me just see if I can zoom in a little more for you. See a little more detail. It gets grainier when you zoom in too much, but. Is it unnecessary to use light pollution filters or hydrogen alpha or oxygen 3 filters to improve the images? Um, well, I... Hmm. Is it unnecessary? Uh, well, depending on where you are, I certainly don't need to use that kind of thing, but I have no light pollution here. Um, using hydrogen or oxygen filters um, can help with hydrogen specific or oxygen specific um, areas of the sky like um, uh, certain nebulae um, emit in those regions um, and for those types of nebulae it, uh, they can really help immensely to bring out their detail. Um, but of course it cuts everything else out. When, anytime you use a filter you have to increase your gain or exposure levels because it uh, you're cutting out a lot of light. So you have to you know have a lot more gain or exposure time to get to see the object that you're trying to see but once you do that um, it brings them out nicely course when you've got those filters in those are the only objects that you can really see so um, they can help in some situations um, but it, it really depends on the targets that you want to look at <coughs> but it's not completely necessary no um, you know using a color camera you know we looked at three planetary nebulas early on um, and most of them were bluish and greenish, which means they're tending to be oxygen rich. So an O3 filter might have helped with some of that, but um, 
I don't know. I, I, I'm actually the wrong person to ask. I don't really use filters. I don't have them, and I don't really use them. I do have a, an ultra-high contrast filter that I bought, but I haven't played around with it much. Um, and uh, so I guess I'm probably just the wrong person to ask. I'd get on Cloudy Nights or um, Stargazer's Lounge or whatever your favorite astronomy um, forum is and ask ask the astrophotographers who know a lot more than I do about about filter use. Uh, I know there are light pollution filters that really work great um, if you do live in a fairly light polluted area. Um, in particular I think the Optolong uh, L Enhance and L Extremes are getting some pretty good praises right now for light pollution filters. But I have no experience with them so can't really tell you much. Anyway, this is looking like we're probably got pretty good, pretty good amount of detail on, th on uh, 1003. So I think I'm going to save us as is here and uh, get ready to move on to the next object. <coughs> Came out pretty well. Okay, we'll stop the stack. And drop us back. Drop us back there. And what's our next object? All right. Well, let's do C23, another galaxy here. Let's see what that one looks like. Okay, I want to assume we're probably on it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, looks like a bit of an edge on this one. Uh-huh. Nice. Settle a little bit. All right, and we'll undo our stretch. And this was what? 891. 891. All right, start our stack. Clear out 1003. <coughs> Let's see what we can see from here. Randy, as I age, my eyes are not working as well without visual. Oh, with visual, I can relate. Randy, definitely can. EAA will be a big plus for my wife and I. We also get many visitors that will benefit from this change. Yeah, it's actually much easier. Um, it's much easier for everybody to see what you're seeing if they're looking at a screen as opposed to an eyepiece. For some people, it's actually difficult to look through an eyepiece. They have a hard time getting themselves lined up with it, and um, it's just uh, it's a struggle for some people to actually use an eyepiece. And obviously, in this day and age of COVID and ya ya ya, sharing an eyepiece isn't necessarily desirable anyway. With everybody, you know, coming up and touching the same eyepiece with a part of their face, you know, it's just. But when you can put something on a screen, and even put it on a secondary large monitor people can stand back and look at everybody can e see that really easily you know even if you have astigmatism and no matter what's going on with your eyes um, you know other issues like that um, you can uh, you can see much easier on a screen than you can um, on uh, you know through an eyepiece so it's uh, it just makes a lot of things a lot easier one of the things it doesn't make easier, of course, is setup because now you've got a lot more gear. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm sitting here running two laptops and wires and cables and power and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, and there's computer software that you have to learn how to run and all that stuff. So it's it's complicated on one hand, but um, you know, it's it's very advantageous on another. So, um, yeah, I, I, but I but I really love it. It's it's a lot of fun. <clears throat> and this one is looking like a big, beautiful galaxy. A nice edge-on galaxy with a, a very clear, sharp 
dust lane going right around the outer periphery right there. That is just a spectacular looking galaxy. You know, even after just a couple of minutes of of data, it's uh, really quite a spectacular looking one. I'm really kind of doing these in, you know, more spatial order, not uh, not the order of uh, of how spectacular they are, so we never know what we're going to get. Some of these are going to be much bigger and brighter than others. Some of them are going to be really dinky. <coughs> But this one is definitely one of the big spectacular ones. That's pretty sweet. It's looking like over here, too. It looks like another little galaxy, sort of a little spiral galaxy over here. <laughs> one in here. Looks like maybe one there. Heck, I have as much fun finding all the other galaxies as the... Yeah, here's one right here. That looks like one right there. Just rich fields of them. And the monochrome camera does so well with the galaxies. Just really makes them pop. Yeah, Al, I am... Um, <coughs> well, when I have the 533 in, plate solving is just automatic. Um, it just works every time. It's really fast. It works every time. When I put the 178 in, even when I change the field of view to be what uh, what it should be, it for some reason it just struggles. I don't I don't understand why, but for some reason it just struggles. But I don't know. Other people just use it flawlessly. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I don't get it. Don't know why it works well sometimes and not others. But when it works, it's absolutely wonderful. It's great. Speaking of great, look at this galaxy. Man, that is such a clear, sharp dust lane. That is just spectacular. Zoom in a little bit so you guys can see it a little better. But, yeah, it is just, just spectacular. my field of view. Uh, yeah, I was supposed to set it to 0.47. Hopefully that's what I set it to. I um, suppose I could go look real quick. But it was supposed to be 0.47. Did I close the software? I did. I closed the software. Got a minute here while that does that. Should have been 0 0.7, but yeah. Yeah, I did it right. I don't know. I've tried monkeying with the settings, too. And, uh, I don't know. For some reason, I just can't make it work reliably. <coughs> don't know why, but there you are. Not all software is perfect. But this galaxy is perfect. This is just gorgeous. That's a great looking galaxy there. Edge on, perfectly edge on with a dust lane running right through the middle of it. It's just spectacular. <laughs> <clears throat> if 
fact, we don't even need to spend any more time on that. That is coming in so nicely that I don't think we need to do much more with that. <coughs> Maybe another minute. <coughs> but it just looks really good sitting there floating out in space. How far away is this one? Did we say how far away this was? 30. Oh, 30 million. Okay. This is 30 million. That's why it's so nice. It's so close. 30 million light years is not very far away at all. Even so, that's a pretty big that's a pretty big galaxy. The silver, silver galaxy edge on unbarred spiral, 30 million light years away. It's a member of the group of galaxies in the local supercluster, right? Visible to small modern vein, elongated smear with a dust lane visible in larger apertures. Uh, NGC 891 looks as the Milky Way would look like when viewed edge on. Um, some astronomers have even noted how similar NGC 891 our galaxy looks as seen from the southern hemisphere. In fact, both galaxies are considered very similar in terms of luminosity and size. Studies of the dynamics of its molecular hydrogen have also proven the likely presence of a central bar. Huh. So maybe they do think it has a bar. Despite this, recent high-resolution images of its dusty disk show unusual filamentary patterns. These patterns are extending into the halo of the galaxy away from the galactic disk. Scientists presume that supernova explosions caused this interstellar dust to be thrown out of the galactic disk toward the halo. It may also be possible that the light pressure from surrounding stars causes this phenomenon. <coughs> Cool. Gorgeous galaxy. Gorgeous, gorgeous. All right. Well, let's save that one and see what we've got waiting for us next. Stop the stack. And zoom back out. Where were we? Yeah, you're kind of... You're close. Okay. So we've done that one. Let's do PGC 891 next. This one's going to be much smaller and fainter. I can tell you that already. <coughs> Smaller and fainter. Let's see if we can spot it with the naked eye here. Ooh, that's kind of an interesting one. Oh, interacting, yeah. So two stars there, which may be these two right here, maybe these two. So if so, it's going to be right in here. In a little triangle of stars. Yeah, so we may be actually right on there, so let's pop a few seconds on there. This probably is it. It's probably right about there. Yeah. Yep, it's right in there. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and get that stuff on there. And then we will Wait for our first frame to come in, make sure it's good. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, 
And this is PGC 8961. PGC 8961, PGC 8961, go, go, and clear out the old one. Okay. Let's see what comes in here. Boop, look at that. So this is a couple of interacting galaxies. spirally, wispy, spirally things. Next to a couple of bright stars. Love it when those frames come in, that those additional subs come in and just the whole background just darkens poof, immediately. Wispy arms of hair, and then a looks like a barred spiral down here. P273 or PGC 8961. A pair of interacting galaxies 300 million light years away. The constellation Andromeda. First described in the Atlas of Particular Galaxies. Compiled by Halton Arp. In 1966, the larger of the spirals, known as UGC 1810, is about five times more massive than the smaller galaxy. It has a disk that is tidally distorted into a rose-like shape by the gravitational pull of the companion galaxy below it. The smaller galaxy shows distinct signs of active star formation at its nucleus, and is thought that the smaller galaxy has actually passed through the larger one. Huh. So they think they've actually collided and passed through. <coughs> the smaller one has actually passed through the larger one. That's interesting. <sighs> Zoom in a little bit more on that. Let's see if we can push the stretch as well. Yeah, actually, let's see if we can do a couple adjustments here. Yeah, come on. <coughs> that shows up a little bit better for you. Got to make sure things, uh, got to brighten it up a lot more for the live stream than I would normally do for myself. But you can really see the wispy arms of the, the bigger galaxy.
Hmm. So they're thinking that the little barred spiral below has already passed through. They've already collided and passed through each other. Which is an interesting thing about about galaxies when they do collide. In fact, that's what they think is going to happen with our galaxy uh, and the Andromeda galaxy that's only a couple of million light years away. That's our, our nearest galaxy is. Um, then in a few billion years uh, we're going to actually collide with each other. But there is so much space is so vast and there is so much distance between stars in a galaxy even though when you look at a galaxy and you say that's just a big lump of light composed of billions if not hundreds of billions of stars but the reality is there's so much distance between the stars in a galaxy that an, an, two entire galaxies can collide and pass right through each other and none of the stars or objects in either galaxy will actually physically contact each other. The reason that the two objects will tear each other apart and misshape each other like they think these two galaxies did uh, is simply because of their gravity. You know, one, they each have their own gravity well, and when they come together, the gravity well of one tears apart the other and misshapes it and causes it to kind of spill all over the place. And uh, But even with hundreds of billions of stars coming toward each other, none of them actually end up hitting each other because there is so much space between individual stars. Even at the the core of the galaxies where they're most dense. There's still light years between them. And so it, uh, it's just a pretty wild thing to, th to think about. But coming along pretty nicely. It's a pretty interesting feature. Pretty interesting little uh, little pair there. We look to see if there are uh, other galaxies around. Not seeing a whole lot of other ones in these with these guys. Yeah, they're pretty interesting things. This, I believe, is a foreground star in our own galaxy. Yeah, see, I'm pretty sure this is a star in our own galaxy. This is as well. The core of this actually is, uh, and here's, you know, these are all the stars that we see here, of course, are in our own galaxy, and they're therefore much, 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 much closer than the, the galaxies we see in the background. Um, so this is a star. It's, it's sharp. This is a star. This is a star. These are stars. This here looks like the core of that galaxy. It's much fuzzier. And uh, so that, I'm pretty sure, is the core of, of that galaxy. And then this is the core of this barred spiral. But everything else, all the other spots of light we see here, um, are stars, foreground stars in our own galaxy. <coughs> I'm being buzzed.
buzz bombed by like a little moth right now. <laughs> Well, that's pretty fun. I think we've probably gotten, we've got about 11 minutes on that. I think it's probably about good for that one. So, let's see what we got next. That is a pretty cool little deal. Okay. Let's see, NGC 925, I think, was the next one. I see 167. What is that? Okay, okay. Alright, so we'll just do 925 next. Send the scope over there and see what we can see. Maximize our stretch. Yeah, we've got something right in there. Looking like. <coughs> Just a little guy. Well, might actually be able to see some structure in there. It looks like we definitely have something there. Pop a couple extra. Ay, not eight. A little extra. A couple extra seconds in there and see. Yeah, that's definitely it. Okay, good. Well, let's... I think we're pretty close. Come on. Okay, that went way too far. Settle in about right. Get that centered in there. Yeah, that's pretty good. And we'll synchronize that on our mount. And then we will reset all these things. How's our temperature on the camera doing? Still hanging about 15. That works. Okay, and we'll start our stack. Oh, no, wait. Before we start the stack, we have to NGC 925. NGC 925. All right, now we'll start the stack. Clear out 891. And... Start the new one. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a nice one. That is going to be a nice one. Collect a few frames of data on this. Should be pretty cool.
far away is this one? Distance. Hmm. Don't doesn't say what the distance is on this. NGC 925. Let's see what Wikipedia says. NGC 925. Amatha Galaxy is a barred spiral located about 30 million light years away. Okay, so again, it's one of our, it's one of our more local guys. Morphological classification of the galaxy, and again, it has a bar structure, loosely wound spiral arms with no ring. The spiral arm to the south is stronger than the northern arm, with the latter appearing flocculent and less coherent. The bar is offset from the center of the galaxy and is the site of star formation all along its length. Both of these morphological traits, a dominant spiral arm and the offset bar, are typical characteristics of a Magellanic spiral galaxy. The galaxy is inclined at an angle of 55 degrees to the line of sight. The <coughs> galaxy is a member of our local group. However, the nearest member lies 650,000 light years distant from it. There is a 10 million solar mass cloud of natural neutral hydrogen attached to 925 by a streamer. 10 million. There is a 10 million solar mass cloud of neutral hydrogen attached to NGC 925 by a streamer. It is uncertain whether this is a satellite dwarf galaxy, the remnant of a past tidal interaction, or a cloud of primordial gas. Hmm. Okay. Don't know that we're going to be able to see that kind of detail on here, but can always hope. <laughs> it is a pretty nice looking one, though. See how our histogram is doing here. Yeah, doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Get some nice structure in there. Definitely clumps. Clumps of star formation in here. A lot of this again is these are all foreground stars in our own galaxy, but there are clearly clumps in here of nebulosity, probably star forming regions in this galaxy. Nice lump there, another one there. Kind of one out here.
let's see, I've been going for about two and a half hours, a little over. I think we'll do another couple of uh, objects here. What have I got left? Yeah, I know we've got M33. I see 167. We've done these. We've done that one. We did Crystal Ball. NGC 2444 is just so far down. I don't think we're gonna, I don't think that's gonna come up to an altitude that I can even really do it. It's still below 20 degrees. So I don't think that's something I'm gonna be able to do tonight anyway. Uh, what else did we get here? Anything else? Oh yeah, Superman. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna do We're gonna do Superman. Well, I might try. I see six one sixty seven. We'll give this another minute or two. We'll see what I see one sixty seven. Uh, what is I see one sixty seven? Mag fourteen. That's a pretty dim small one. It's a pretty dim, small one. I can't reselect it. Funny. But I think what we'll do is we'll go to... We'll finish up with Superman and then Triangulum, which is a big, spectacular one. That'll be a good way to finish. But I might try IC 167 next just to see what we can see from it. It's going to be a pretty small, faint one, but mm, might just see. I think those are the the last three we're going to do. That'll be about good for the night. But this one is pretty nice. One of our local guys. Wispy and dusty. catch a whole lot more by getting more aggressive than just other than just putting a bunch more noise in it. But <laughs> Hey John and Kirsten. Yeah, I heard you guys out there. Looking for meteorites, shooting stars. I heard you guys out there looking at stuff. Yeah, we're just gonna probably do a couple of more things and call it a night, but this one came out pretty nice. One of our little local galaxies. NGC 925. So let's save this one. Exactly as seen. And shut off our stack. And head off. Let's see if we can do IC-167. Let's see if we can even find it. Uh, not NGC-964. IC-167. Alright, that is what we're after. Yes, it is. Okay. Let's zoom over there and see what we got. Beep. Oh, it's another little little spiral. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do our little photographic tricks here and see if we can't see it. It's going to be pretty faint and pretty small. Oh, there it is, right there. 
Dead center. Okay. Oh no, wrong way. We will do it. And this is going to be IC 167. I see 167. Huh. Uh. I see 167. Alright. Clear that guy out. Yeah, look at that nice little S. <laughs> so this is one of two S's we're going to see. Oh, look at these. Oh, we got a couple other guys in here, too. A couple of other interesting things we're going to get to see at the same time. Bonus. Yeah. See, there's another one down here, and another one up here, and another one up here. We definitely get those two. I don't think we get the... Uh, yeah, the other one is out here. Yeah, the other one is just off the picture. Uh, this one here is off the picture out here. But we get to see these other ones, so that's kind of cool. <coughs> so, look at that. We got some bonus galaxies on this one. I can even... Uh, Maybe I can even see what those are. Don't limit the mag. Yeah. yeah NGC 691 is what this one is. Mag 13. Yeah. NGC 680. NGC 678. IC 730 is another galaxy there. <laughs> Cool. Very cool. I have it shut. I have those shut off because they're not typically something that I a little too dim for my for my scope and whatnot. But uh, definitely picking them up tonight. So. Definitely picking them up nicely tonight. Actually, brighter than the target we're looking at. So that's kind of fun. Another little field of galaxies here. Billions and billions. As Carl Sagan would say. Billions and billions of them. Billions of galaxies containing billions of stars each. Pretty unlikely we are the only life out here. Whatever life means. However you define that.
<laughs> this one's really neat. The structure is really kind of coming in on this bottom one. Disc in a disc. Kind of fun. This one's a neatly shaped. Two very distinct arms. Kind of a simple little galaxy, but they you know, kind of streams out from there. And this guy here is just disky. Very disky. Push the stretch even a little bit more. Makes it a little noisy, but I think it's worth it. This one is kind of lost in the amp glow of my uh, sensors. This is the very edge of the bottom edge of the sensor of the camera, which has this light band here, which is amp glow from the edge of the sensor. But even so, you can still see the nice structure in there. And this little tadpole here, kind of cool. All right, we hit 10 minutes. That's pretty good. Save this one. Stop our stack. And now we'll move to Superman, which is NGC 7479, I believe. 
Alright, there you are. 74, 79, yep. <coughs> GC 74, 79. This one will be quite a bit brighter. Bigger and brighter than the other one, and uh, it's kind of a cool object. I've imaged this a few other times. Yeah, there you are, right there. I've imaged this a couple other times, and uh, it's a pretty nice object. All right, this away. That's a little too much. That's about right. It might be a little high. That's going to be good. That's going to be about right. Synchronize the mount. All right. Reset our stretch. And we got that set, so... Let's start our stack. <coughs> this is a fun one. There it is. Much more of a bard, a pronounced bard. Spiral. How far away is this one? Distance 120 million. This is 120 million, so this is like four times farther away than the last one. So obviously much, much bigger. Much bigger and brighter. Fun wispy galaxy. Kind of noisy right now, but it'll clean up.
Let's see how our drift is doing. <coughs> This here tracks how much, when each one of our sub-exposures comes in, how different it is in position and rotation from the other one. And uh, so the rotation is within 10 degrees. position is number of pixels <coughs> so ideally these should be fairly clumped close together if my tracking of my mount is doing well so in degrees it's looking like 10 degrees or so hmm about 40 pixels, 30 pixels. Definitely is some movement from one sub-exposure to the other. But better than it used to be, that's for sure. Hmm. You need to be adjusted some. Nice structure, though. Yeah, Orion is, uh, the winter constellations are starting to come up. <coughs> winter is definitely coming in. Orion is dominating the sky in our late nights now, so winter must be almost here. Another couple of months we'll be shooting all of the really cool objects around Orion. Orion is just uh, Ryan is just uh, loaded with all kinds of really cool stuff <coughs> to image and to see. Um, yeah, yes, Kirsten, I did. Uh, I did say it's 120 million light years away. So this one is uh, not in our local group. It's still fairly large and easy to see, though, so... Clearly, it's a large and bright galaxy. Pretty spectacular little, or in this case, big object. Nicely defined, some wispy elements to it, but the two primary arms in the bar are just very well defined. <coughs>
All right, so there's 10 minutes on that. <coughs> and it's pretty cool. So I think we'll save that, and we'll move on to the last target of the night. Which is going to be the Triangulum Galaxy, which is one of the biggest, most spectacular galaxies in our sky. So I saved that one intentionally for last, because it's a big, fun one. And right now it's pretty much up near the very top. Let me select it. Oh, yes, you are. There we go. All right. <coughs> Send the scope over to it. It's pretty much right up the top. Which is a great place to view it. should be pretty easy to see because it's big and bright and there it is up there okay so let's bring it down a little bit into our field of view and bring it over here a little bit that's probably going to be about right that's probably going to be about right Set this. Okay, and then we need to, uh, yeah, it's kind of nice. It's going to be a nice big target. Ah, shoot, I forgot I did that. All right. Start our stack. Clear the Superman galaxy out. And this was probably going to require some... Big spectacular. Unfortunately, it's oriented kind of sideways to the way my camera is, but big spectacular galaxy. This is one of our two or three of our. our, our <coughs> in fact, I think this might be the second or third closest galaxy to us. The Andromeda galaxy, of course, is the closest one, um, and that's just way too big for my... And that just fills my screen like crazy. Um, but this one, which unfortunately I wish we... I wish it was 90 degrees the other way because then it would actually fill the whole view. <coughs> but it's... tis the way it is. And... Uh, but it's still a spectacular galaxy. Even with only just two subs, it's already quite nice. We can't quite see some of the outer lying arms at the very top and bottom, but it's a uh, it's a spectacular target. Pretty cool target it is, it is. Alright, I'll put a full screen on this. Good way to finish the night. Big old galaxy. 
Lots of detail. Again, a lot of the the dots of light you see are foreground stars in, in our own Milky Way galaxy, but lots of these big bright patches in here are actually star forming regions in the Triangulum Galaxy itself, sometimes called the Pinwheel Galaxy. These are all bright, hot regions of the galaxy where most likely star star formation is occurring. Pretty spectacular target. <laughs> With only four minutes of data, it still looks pretty darn awesome. How far away is this? Yeah, so it's only 2.7 million light years. So I think this is the second closest. Only Andromeda at like 2.2 or whatever million miles away, million light years away, is the closest. This one's at about 2.7, 2.8. So a little bit further away, but kind of the Milky Way, the Triangulum, and Andromeda are kind of the three, the three local companions. So this is kind of our, one of our neighbors, our closest neighbors. Let's see what Wikipedia has to say. Mm. Triangulum Galaxy is a spiral galaxy. 2.7 million light years from Earth. It's the third largest member of the local group behind the Milky Way and the Andromeda. It's one of the most distant permanent objects that can be viewed with the naked eye. The galaxy is the smallest spiral galaxy in the local group and is believed to be a satellite of the Andromeda galaxy or on its rebound into the latter due to their interaction and velocity and proximity to one another in the night sky. It also has a hydrogen 2 nucleus. Sometimes informally referred to as the pinwheel galaxy by amateur astronomers and some computerized telescopes are in some public outreach websites. However, the SIMBAD astronomical database, a professional database, collates formal designations for astronomical objects and indicates that pinwheel galaxy refers to M101, not M33, which several amateur astronomy resources, including public outreach websites, identify by that name, and that is within the bounds of, yeah, the real, the, the actual pinwheel galaxy M101 is, is in Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. <coughs> Uh, under exceptionally good viewing conditions with no light pollution, triangulum can be seen with the naked eye. Um, it is the farthest permanent entity visible without magnification. Its light spreads across a little more than a pinprick of the unmagnified sky. 
the cause of which is its broadness. <coughs> so it's a it's a very broad, diffuse object, not a intense, bright one. I think it was discovered in 1654. Anyway, pretty spectacular thing. And a great way to end the night. Thanks for coming, Al. Appreciate it. And for everyone else who's still stuck around with me for this long. <coughs> John and Kirsten and Mitch and Mom, I don't know if you guys are still there or not, and Randy and etc. Anybody who's still with me. How long have I been going here? Well, let's see. Uh, three hours and 20 minutes. So, it's been a while. But, good way to finish. Give it another minute here, but I think it's pretty well what we're going to get is what we've got. It's a pretty spectacular target, the Triangulum. Pretty spectacular. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Well, I, I get to share the podium with the SpaceX launch, huh? That's that's a pretty good compliment. I'll take that. <coughs> Thanks, Curtis, for coming. I'll check out your uh, your PM later, probably tomorrow. And uh, yeah, so <coughs> I'm toying with the idea of possibly doing another live stream tomorrow night. We'll see how I feel, but. Uh, just about run out of this dark of the moon period right now. Moon is going to start dominating our sky, so tomorrow night probably be the last shot before it uh, starts brightening our sky and make these make all these faint little objects much harder to see. But it's been a lot of fun tonight. Thanks to uh, <coughs> the folks at Cloudy Night for the, uh, the Observer's Challenge. Was it, uh, yeah, it was uh, his role, I believe. Who's, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, thanks to uh, Roll for the, uh, the challenge this month. That was a lot of fun. <coughs> Good targets, interesting targets. It was a nice time. So, yeah, trying Yellow Galaxy. Very cool. All right, everybody, I think I'm just going to save this as we have it here. And I think I'm going to sign off for the night. Getting cold and getting hungry, so I think I'm just going to call it. Thanks everybody for joining, and uh, if I um, do something tomorrow night, I may may or I may do something tomorrow night, but I'll send out the usual notifications if I do, and uh, see you then. If not, I'll see you next time, whenever that is going to be. But thanks for uh, thanks for attending tonight, and I appreciate you being here and staying with me, and uh, I will see you next time. Thanks everybody. Good night.